Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, and uh, welcome to uh, the Dolly Museum. Oh, there we go. Um, it is a very rainy day. I am, I am very impressed by your per persistence and, uh, and goodwill to come out and hope that today is worth the, uh, the effort. Um, so we're here today to talk about the exhibition um, Chiita, or at least in a very remote way. And since uh, we didn't have the opportunity to talk specifically about the show, it seemed like this would be a good opportunity to examine and think about some of Dali's images um, that are actually constructions that represent surrealist sculpture. And surrealist sculpture is very, very different than what, uh, what we see upstairs with the Chiita exhibition. So for example, just to give you the background, what we normally think of when we think of 20th century sculpture, this is a, a clay piece that we have up in the gallery by Chiita. Um, although it's a brick, it's been incised, it's been baked, it has a, a number of properties that are very organic, it's very pure. Um, moving to other figures, of course, Pablo Picasso is one of the very first and most important 20th century sculptors, as well as a painter and creator and imaginative uh, figure. Of course, we at one time had the head of Fernand here at an exhibition in our old building, which was an amazing piece, and this is uh, his guitar, which reimagines what sculpture can be, influencing a great deal of different uh, pathways in the 20th century. This is his still life, which actually was shown at one of the galleries that I'll be showing in a little bit. This is a still life by uh, Picasso, where he's actually created a three-dimensional object, which is also a cubist product and a sculpture, but it has to do with objects. And so this also leads into some of the ideas involving um, uh, surrealism and also um, assemblage and construction. Of course, Brancusi is one of the greatest of all 20th century artists and one of the great influences on Chiita. Um, you can see the sort of African influence on the piece on the left. And then Bird in Space is perhaps one of the most elegant and early statements of minimalism, um, just capturing that idea of the uh, the, the wing in flight. And finally, just to wrap it up, um, Giacometti and Henry Moore representing very, two very different paths in terms of how to deal with the human form. All of these are very conventional and very much embody sort of the tradition of 20th century sculpture. When we come to surrealism though, we're in a different world and that'll be clear in just a few moments. Um, so the origins, Breton and the surrealist object. Uh, surrealist objects were addressed by André Breton, the leader of surrealism, as early as 1924, right when the um, exhibition, uh, right when the movement actually began. He wrote in a, a, uh, one of his essays, Pont de Jour, he states that the creation and circulation of dream objects, which had the potential to, to discredit creatures and things of reason, extending the limits of so-called reality. This is a goal that he's stating for the creation of objects. It's a really strange statement. He's basically talking about objects, you know, very much like a refrigerator, a phone, a fountain pen. But these objects that he's talking about, he's hoping that they have the potential to discredit reason, that there's something about the objects that he's thinking about that are not objects that we're familiar with. One of the influences which I think becomes very clear, is, um, is a particular writer from the 19th century named Comte de Lautremont, also known as um, the writer of La Chance de Maldoror. Uh, this gentleman who died at a very young age, I think he died at the age of 20, uh, wrote two very influential pieces, two very influential books. One of them is called The Songs of Maldoror, and it has a passage in it which became sort of the emblem or the motto of surrealism. As beautiful as the chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on an operating or dissecting table. The last word is missing from there. But essentially it's been recreated here in this object form. I'm not exactly sure by who. It's absurd, it's very violent, it's strange, and it's sexual. And all of these things come into play when you're talking about surrealism and the object. Another really important influence on this idea of objects, surprisingly, is a painter. Uh, Giorgio de Chirico, who deeply influenced almost every major surrealist painter, including definitely Salvador Dali, um, created a number of paintings where objects are left uh, basically to their own device. 
They accumulate, they seem to gather, they do strange things, they provoke us. And this one in particular is called Metaphysical Interior with Biscuits, which are lovely. We can see the biscuits over here. Very much like those Dolly boxes that we see up in the gallery where Dolly has accumulated certain things like watches in them. Um, Dolly later talks about the influence of de Chirico in relation to the surrealist object and talks about the cannibalism impulses that such objects might engender, leading to uh, Dolly's whole obsession with the Angelus theme, and that we will get to a little bit later. So now I have two long quotes by, by uh, Andre Breton that I think are really important to share before we move much further. He said, I recently proposed to fabricate, insofar as possible, certain objects which are approached only in dreams and which seem to be no, uh, no more useful than enjoyable. So he's talking about this compulsion, that he's dreaming of objects and he feels the need to manufacture them. Recently, while I was asleep, I came across a rather curious book in an open-air market named Saint Mayo. So he's talking about flea markets in his dreams. Uh, the back of the book was formed by a wooden gnome whose white beard, clipped in an Assyrian manner, reached to his feet. The statue was of ordinary thickness, but did not prevent me from turning the pages, which were of a heavy black cloth. I was anxious to buy it, and upon waking, was sorry not to find it near me. It was comparatively easy to recall it. So he's talking about this sort of the sense that reality should be more than it is because these objects should exist, but they don't. And he goes on to say that uh, I would like to put into circulation certain objects of this kind which appear eminently problematic and intriguing. Perhaps in that way, I should help to demolish these concrete trophies which are so odious to throw further discredit upon those creatures and things of reason. And here he is talking about this, um, a, a phrase he uses, the paucity of reality, the lack, the fact that we expect more from reality than reality gives us. And so the idea of the surrealist object potentially can inform some of our decisions on how to look to the irrational and the imagination to provide sort of um, the surplus missing from our regular daily life. Um, this is one of the, the great objects of surrealism. It's the Murray Oppenheim's teacup. We'll talk about that shortly, but um, dream objects became the basis of surrealist objects. Um, and the idea is aligned with Sigmund Freud's concept of fetishism, not surprisingly. So let's take a moment and talk a little bit about what is a fetish object. How does the Freudian fetish relate to this? Um, for Freud, he said that the ordinary object becomes a fetish because we project our desire upon it and because we look at it and look again and cannot stop looking at it. So a high-heeled shoe. It's just an anonymous object. It's something we wear. But through obsession, through kind of this compulsion to keep looking at it, to associate it with the wearer, it suddenly becomes a fetish. It becomes something that, uh, that drives the imagination. It goes on to say that the selection of this object, like any Dada object, is random. And we'll see in a moment how Dada approaches its objects. So there's no, no necessary um, outcome that a, a high-heeled shoe will be your fetish. However, it very much easily could become one. And like the surrealist object, the choice is not as significant as the meaning your psychology informs it with. So the, the shoe is just a shoe, but as soon as your imagination starts you know, obsessing about it, it becomes something other, it becomes a fetish. Uh, the fetish is always a substitute for something else and always has a sexual content, at least in Freud's world. Um, and it's always a, sub, a substation for sexual satisfaction. I think that substitution is perhaps the word that was supposed to be there. Maybe it's a substation too, I don't know. But uh, there is that dimension to it. And of course, coming back to Freud, always, you know, there is a sense of the castration anxiety. It's always about males with Freud and with surrealism. They inherit the, the kingdom, the palace of Freudian psychology. So for them, it is also always based on males. But, uh, Freud describes a sexual fetish in men as the result of childhood trauma regarding castration anxiety. And this, this image came up when I typed in castration anxiety. It's like, oh my God, this is great. It has nothing to do with surrealism, but everything to do with fun. <laughs> um, which brings us to another pair of shoes. And the fetish object, uh, it becomes a triumph over the threat of castration. It allows the individual to have protection against that fear. 
So that is essentially how Freud describes the mechanism of the fetish. And in his interpretation of dreams, he notes how the mechanisms of displacement and condensation, these are mechanisms he says work in our dream, dream work. Whenever we're dreaming, we're constantly using displacement and condensation. Uh, they can locate objects to new contexts and produce hybrid forms. And I think that's really important. When we see objects like the Surrealist lobster phone, that's a hybrid form. It's two very different worlds that are sort of forced together and create a new meaning. So in a way, this, this explanation also refers to the, the idea of juxtaposition, that whenever there's the method of juxtaposition in surrealism, it's doing what Freud describes dream work as doing. So the fetish character of, uh, of surrealist objects derives from their play with the erotically charged substitution and fragments for the body. And we'll see a number of these in a few moments. So now let's look at some objects. And before we get to surrealism, we really do have to start with Dada and really Marcel Duchamp. He is the, he is the man. He is the man we are also going to be featuring uh, next spring. We are going to have a, a, a Marcel Duchamp Dali exhibition, I believe, in February. So this is going to be a pretty incredible opportunity to see how some of these ideas play out. So we start with the bottle rack. And the bottle rack was created in 1914. And as with most surrealist objects, it was lost in time, and it was recreated in 1964. So Marcel Duchamp authorized a re-edition to replace the thing that was no longer existed. These are now highly, highly valuable. Whenever we see surrealist objects, nine times out of 10, they're recreations of the original. And remarkably, they are pushing up towards the million dollar category. So there was usually four to six to 10 of these that would be authorized to be produced, but they are as rare as the original one is, which is pretty remarkable um, because they are multiples. This is, re this is basically a wine drying rack. This is, if you were a wine dealer, once the bottle would be empty, you'd put your wine bottle here, it would dry, and you would use it again. But for, um, for Duchamp, the idea was that he was attracted to, well, his, his goal at this point was basically to carry on um, an adversarial dialogue with the concept of art. What constitutes art? For him, there were so many restrictions that seemed arbitrary and irrelevant that he basically was waging war with these. So once he designates this as an art object and refers to it as the, um, the hedgehog, which is one of the terms that was used, it suddenly becomes something different than a bottle drying rack. Um, for Andre Breton, looking at this object, which is referred to as a ready-made, because it's something that's not created, it's not crafted, it's not even thought about prior to its designation. It's something that Duchamp encounters and decides that will be an object that will be taken out of functioning as a manufactured object and will suddenly become an aesthetic experience. So for Breton, the ready-made's chief attraction lay in the notion of changing the role as applying the activity of transforming a commonplace object and helping it achieve a separate new identity. So if its identity is to, to dry bottles, it no longer functions that way. It now is completely transformed into something different. And that, in, in and of that, it becomes the aesthetic experience of, of art. So one final thought is the appeal of the ready-made could also derive from the immediacy of the found object. And it's really important, this idea that there is no sculptural or aesthetic consi consideration that's brought to, brought to bear on this. It is the total absence of good taste or bad taste. So everything we saw earlier, the Picasso, the Brancusi, the Giacometti, those are all driven by the idea of taste. They're beautiful forms, they're lovely forms, they're arresting forms, but they're always sculpted, they're crafted, they're made with intent, they come, they're informed by um, technique. This is informed by zero technique. There is nothing about the technique or training of the artist that allows him to produce this. It's rather a emptying out of aesthetic decisions which allows this piece to be, to not function, to not um, suggest what it normally was and to have a new role and be transformed through the decision to make it an aesthetic object. Perhaps an easier uh, example, this is the bicycle wheel, created originally in 1913, reproduced in a series in 1951. It's also a ready-made, but it's what Marcel Duchamp called a rectified ready-made. And what rectified means is he's encountered two separate objects that exist in the real world and have functions. You sit on a, a seat, 
you ride a bike and moves you through space. If you take the bicycle wheel and put it on top of the seat, you can't sit on it and you can't use it to move through space. So he's, in one simple gesture, ruined both of the utilitarian reasons that these things exist. But he's created something new. He's juxtaposed two things and created a third idea. And he often would point out how if you spin the wheel, it creates this sort of hypnotic pattern that he liked very much. So there is also an aesthetic contemplation that comes along with this experience. But we are looking at something very different than a Brancusi or a Jacques Cometti. You know, this is a very different world that uh, Duchamp is suggesting. It gets even weirder with this piece. This is, uh, for some people, one of their favorite uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp objects. This is called Why Not Sneeze Iro se la vie. And Iro se la vie, or Rose se la vie, depending on how you pronounce that, is his alter alternate um, transgendered identity. He has often had photographs of himself dressed as Iro se la vie. And of course, when you pronounce the name, it means Eros, that is the life. You know, love, that is the life. Um, eroticism, that is the life. But this object is basically an empty, um, it's a bird's nest. It's just, it was an empty bird's nest. He filled it with little marble sugar cubes. And he placed also a thermometer in there. And he also has included a cuttlefish bone. I'm not gonna go into why those choices may have been made, but I can say that for Andre Breton, this object had an incredible delight simply by the act of surprise. That if you try to lift this object up, because those are marble sugar cubes, it defies expectation. It's far heavier than, than he expected or anyone moving this would have expected. And that becomes for Duchamp the reason that this is a, a delightful and strange and exotic sort of experience that needs to be celebrated. 151 uh, marble cubes, just, just so you know. And I think we get that in the show, I hope. Another object that's by, of course, the colleague of Marcel Duchamp, but still before surrealism, is Man Ray's object, Gift. And this was created as a gift for um, Eric Satie, the composer. Not exactly sure what the intent or meaning behind that gesture is, because I think they were friends. But looking at this, you wouldn't think so. Um, but this takes a very simple utilitarian object, an iron that you would heat up and then use on clothing, put a few tacks on the bottom of it, and suddenly it's completely dysfunctional. It does not do what it's supposed to do. What's more, it's been pointed out by others, perhaps later looking back at it, suggests a kind of vagina dente, that kind of fear of the male of castration, and, uh, and some of those ideas associated with it. Perhaps not an immediate association, but certainly it is an association that has resonance as we get further into surrealism. And so the final object from, uh, from Dada, that sort of part of the backdrop to surrealism, is this incredibly strange and bizarre object, perhaps the most important object that uh, Duchamp created. This was done over a period of eight years, from 1915 to 1923. It's called The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors Even, or it's also referred to as The Large Glass. It was destroyed, and there are several um, um, new versions of it. The Philadelphia Museum of Art has one of them. We are actually borrowing one for our exhibition, so we are incredibly excited about that. It is a very abstract, complicated, object. It has an entire box of notes and diagrams and ideas that associates and goes along with it. And so there's this, this other interesting thing that gets added through surrealism and through Dada, which is the idea of the supplement or the appendix, that an art object is not in and of itself complete. It always requires explanation, diagrams, charts, graphs, poems, some sort of supplement in order to understand it properly. That's a really unique idea, and it's very anti-modern, I suppose. You know, there's this idea that an art object should be complete in and of itself and doesn't require anything beyond it. For Dada and Surrealism, that's not true at all. And just real briefly, this is the, the, the bride. This is the cloud to which all the bachelors gathered down here have to try to impress her by shooting stuff up, perhaps ejaculation, which they grind themselves, and it gets very complicated as an explanation. But uh, sandwiched between the plates of glass are reproductions of mechanical objects from advertisements and technical publications. So the additional part is that even though there's some crafted, designed imagery in this, it's not done by his hand. It's chosen from, you know, from basically technical publications. There's a chocolate grinder, there's a water mill, there's a chest expander. 
Um, all of these things will make more sense next year when we have the show. I think we're not going to get <laughs> caught in that. But this leads us finally to surrealism and the surreal object. And for André Breton, he wrote very early on, as we mentioned, this idea of the dream object based on that book that, was the, that had the gnome beard on the back, the Assyrian bearded gnome. And he thought that these objects function symbolically, that there's a symbolic dimension that surrealism brings to their choice of objects. He goes on to say that I'd like to have these in, circulate, in circulation because their fate seems extremely problematic and troubling. And thus, by putting them into circulation as a regular manufactured object, perhaps they will start to, I guess, uh, pull aside the curtains of what we consider to be reality, suggesting more possibilities. And one of the things that comes out in his novel, Naja, is how important the flea market is to this experience. This idea of throwing yourself into a space where a lot of manufactured objects have come to rest and die. <laughs> Things that suddenly have no utilitarian purpose anymore. Strange objects, bizarre objects. Objects that clearly were manufactured for some reason, but we look at them and we, are, we have no context. We do not know what these things were even used for to begin with. Andre Breton loved this experience. And one day when he was with um, Alberto Giacometti, they went to this particular flea market, and both of them encountered objects while they were there together that proved to be kind of revelation, uh, revelations to both of them. For Giacometti, it was finding a gas mask that was used in the um, First World War that was in a very old sort of strange shape that did not look like a gas mask anymore. And it actually allowed him to resolve a problem he was having with a particular sculpture. So it's almost like a destined you know, manifestation, like a synchronicity uh, might be a word that would never been used by the surrealist, but would make sense in this context. For Breton, he found something that, that really um, allowed him to move forward. Let me come back to that in a moment. He discovered this object. And prior to going to the flea market that day, he had asked Giacometti to create for him an object that seemed to be coming from his dreams. He had a, a dream of a slipper that was also an ashtray. And he described it to, uh, to Giacometti, and he referred to it as the Cinderella ashtray. And when he saw this object, which was a spoon, where you can see at the very base of it, there's a high-heeled shoe attached, it suddenly became sort of the revelation of exactly what he had asked to be created. It was like, by desiring it, by dreaming it, suddenly he found it by going in a very backhand manner. And so he describes the experience of finding this object as capable of admitting him to an almost forbidden world of sudden parallels, terrifying, um, uh, petrifying coincidences, and reflexes particular to each individual of harmonies struck as though on a piano, flashes of light that seem to make you really see. So there's a sort of ex extraordinary, um, uh, I guess it would be like an epiphany that these objects bring about in him. So now we arrive at 1930. Yeah, surrealism has gone through a lot of ideas, but not a lot of creation of surrealist objects. There are very, very few. There is a paucity of surrealist objects, despite the fact that there's all this writing about them. And so by 1930, the group goes through a radical change. Um, people like uh, Magritte join the group, Dali joins the group, many of the women start arriving and being part of the uh, conversations. And one of the new arrivals, uh, Rene Magritte, creates a number of object, a number of paintings where objects are the focus. And this is one called The Interpretation of Dreams. And what you see here is basically like a child's primer, like, a, like an ABC book with six objects that have their names attached. But what he's written down below is something quite different. So for the egg, we actually have a word for um, a particular uh, bush, a shrubbery, called the acacia. For the shoe, we have la lune, or the moon. For the bowler hat, or the um, uh, uh, pot, I guess that's that a pot pie hat? Uh, bowler hat, okay. We have uh, snow, the snow. For the um, candle, we have um, the ceiling. For the glass, we have the storm. And for the hammer, we have the desert. And there's a sense that we see the word very clearly. We see the object very clearly. Our mind forces us to try to associate these two things together. And he's breaking that chain. He's saying that the, the, the image is no more tied to reality than the, the word itself, and that putting this together is extremely arbitrary. 
and he's really challenging our assumptions about what words actually connect with reality and how images connect with reality. And that leads us to this object. This is Giacometti. This is one of the most powerful objects, I suppose, of uh, 20th century sculpture. It's the suspended ball. It was reproduced in 1930 in the Surrealism at the Service of the Revolution, and it was actually the impetus for an article written by Salvador Dali. Um, this is a Giacometti's diagram that accompanies it, and in this diagram, which unfortunately cuts off here, it says the illustrations are dream objects and forms that relate to his childhood memories. So he collected a number of these objects that are very similar to what this, uh, Marcel de, uh, Andre Breton was describing. And you can see many of these objects, if you look at them, you probably have seen them before. They are objects that he constructs. For example, this one down here. Um, let's see, the ball is right in the upper right. This object over here, he actually creates many of these objects that he illustrates here. And it's called Mobile and Mute Objects, is the article he writes. And Dolly becomes incredibly inspired by these ideas. And so in 1931, in that same issue, Dolly writes an, object, or writes an article called Surrealist Objects. The next year, it's republished in um, a translation in the English called The Object as Revealed in Surrealist Experiment. And what's interesting is that Dolly, at this point, is writing about objects very um, enthusiastically. He's really not creating objects. There's only about one object by Dolly. And then for about four years, there's nothing. He's doing paintings. But he does a very good job of basically defining the, what's happened so far. What Surrealism was talking about with the object, how de Chirico is influential in this, what Breton was trying to do with dream objects. And he describes this particular object as the most sensational one. He says it's a wooden ball marked with a feminine groove, and it's suspended on a very fine violin string. A bone, a crescent, whose wedge merely gla uh, grazes the cavity. The beholder feels instinctively compelled to slide the ball over the wedge, but the length of the string does not allow full contact between either the ball or the wedge. And so there's this you know, very, very obvious sexual dimension to this of dissatisfaction and a kind of masochistic quality to it. And this appealed to Dolly greatly. What a surprise, right? <laughs> um, you know, and he goes on to say that uh, with a suspended ball, it's the incarnation of uh, these desires, the means of objectification through substitution and metaphor, and there's some sy symbolic expression that constitutes the typical process of sexual perversity, which is in every way similar to poetic creation. And so what he's saying is that this experience, you know, it's just a ball hung from a string, but we substitute in our mind in the same way we do in dreams, associations with these objects, and ultimately it leads to an experience which for Dali is both Freudian, but also poetic in the way that so surrealist poetry operates. So he goes on to say, um, uh, he uh, compliments the influential paranoid, oh, what I'm saying here, sorry, let me go back a moment. We always think of Dali as being a great figure in Surrealism because he creates the paranoid critical method. And that's sort of his, his you know, claim to fame. That's where he really cashes in on his importance. The objects uh, functioning symbolically is the second most important thing Dali brings to the table in Surrealism. Because as an idea, as a concept, it leads to an incredible amount of productivity in the middle of the 1930s by a variety of Surrealists. So it's an article that's not very well known, but it informs all of the things we're gonna be looking at today. His goal with the Surrealist object, which I think is shared by the Surrealist group, discredit the daily world and replace it with the real world of the imagination. So it's constantly about that idea of canceling the sort of um, pedestrian, boring reality that we live in and trying to come to something more fantastic. Uh, Surrealist objects um, make concrete human imagination. Uh, so historically, Dali describes the first phase of Surrealism, which we saw in the Surrealist object, as the enigmatic encounter with the object itself, um, as in uh, Duchamp's found objects or the dream objects from, uh, from uh, Breton, this idea of an encounter, something enigmatic about it that leads to the decision to make that a Surrealist object. In the second phase, which Dali's about to unleash, there is a desire to interfere with the life of objects and to force it to shed its anonymous character. So example, a phone, which becomes a lobster phone. That's where Dolly has encountered something and forced it to do something else or have a new meaning. And it's often achieved by magnifying the erotic character of the object to illustrate the shape of desire. 
So Dali's uh, one object that he produces during this time is perhaps one of the most perverse objects we have. It is really strange. It's a scatological object functioning symbolically, which in many ways, the object functioning symbolically is his whole focus. It's also been referred to as the pubic hair of the virgin. It's the Cyrillic shoe. It's this, um, the shoe of Gala. And it is a very strange and very unbeautiful object. It is grotesque. It is ugly. And what's really curious about it, and let me tell you all the things that are in it, um, Dolly goes on to say that it's a woman's shoe inside of which a glass of warm milk has been placed in the center of a paste in the color of excrement. The mechanism consists of, drip, of dipping in the milk of a sugar lump on which there is a drawing of the shoe so that the dissolving of the sugar and consequently the image of the shoe may be observed. You know, so straightforward explanation of what the heck is that all about? Um, and you can see there's also an erotic photograph. There's a, um, some pubic hair in a small bucket, a uh, small box over here. Essentially what he's done is he's taken the Freudian fetish of the shoe, you know, that already has all these erotic connotations. Then he's taken this image of the sugar cube, which refers to desire, and he talks about it as having to be, he goes on in other places to talk about the milk having putrefied. And so it's, it's, he's taken something that's an object of desire and he's undermined it into being an object of putrefaction and horror. And he even talks about the sublimation of the self and the cannibalizing of the self by the mother represented by milk. So there's this incredibly ingenious and horrifying sort of package that Dali has presented to us where he's both taken Freudian ideas of the fetish and he's turned them on the ear creating something that's much more Dalinian and ultimately you know, really repugnant which was his goal at this point. Um, back to Giacometti. Uh, here's the disagreeable object to be disposed of. Um, it's a very provocative image, to say the least, with a few little barbs here at the end. Um, and it becomes even more provocative in the photograph that Man Ray took of it, where we have this uh, topless woman holding the object in a very um, erotic fashion. So it's, uh, again, it's a dis disagreeable object, and yet somehow she's compelled to connect with it. Now, Valentine Hugo, who was um, a female artist involved with the Surrealist movement, is also used in Dolly's article as an, um, as an illustration of what the Surrealist object could be. What's interesting about Valentine Hugo is that she was totally in love with Breton. She desired Breton. Breton was indifferent to her. She constantly made overtures to try to get in a relationship. Something happened, it was brief, and then it was passed over. But uh, at the period of time that this is happening, she is in this sort of um, chess match with, with Breton, trying to persuade him and seduce him into uh, you know, be in love with her. So she creates this object, and the object is really all about Breton. Um, there's a roulette table in the background, and you can see there's a 13 and a 17. I don't know if you can see that. Those are two numbers that were very important to, to Breton. They were almost magical numbers. So she makes sure that they're included. She has the, the um, dice in the uh, white glove being held, suggesting sort of, I guess, the chance encounters of love and the, the chance um, um, nature of eroticism. And the red glove represents Breton, and the white glove represents her. And so there's something very straightforward and erotic about the way this is presented. But it's also very provocative. It's very strange. If you didn't know those details, you know, it's very perplexing. Um, knowing a little bit of the background makes it a little bit um, over-explained. But it's pretty fascinating the way that these, uh, these objects fulfill some sort of um, imaginative desire. And then we come to perhaps one of two of the most horrific images associated with uh, surrealism. This is the woman with her throat cut. This is an object that I would claim is somewhat outside of the realm of what I'm discussing, because we're discussing surrealist objects. This is much more in line with, uh, with traditional sculpture. It's crafted, it's developed um, with a lot of technique, it's made in bronze, there's no found object that's been included or assembled into the, art, the object itself, but it's very provocative for what happens with some of the other objects afterwards. The reason this also relates to surrealism is that it was produced as a response to an obsessional dream that uh, Giacometti kept having, where he describes that he had the desire to rape and kill. Definitely some unhinged ideas that we probably don't want to know about, but it's one of those objects when you see it, 
you are compelled to look at it, male or female, it doesn't matter what your gender is, there's something about it that is arresting and it's like a car accident. You can't look away even though it's horrific. And of course the female has also become insectoid, almost like uh, the suggestion of maybe a praying mantis. And the Cyrillists saw the praying mantis as being the female equivalent of the vampire or the succubus. And of course, in, in captivity, when mantises mate, the female will then uh, cannibalize the male. So this has to do with these ideas that are floating around in surrealism. But you can see the way that it's, it's splayed out. It's, uh, it's shocking, it's horrific, it's strange, and it has to do with, again, a dream that compels him to have to create it. And uh, that's just basically what this is saying here about the insect associations. And then there's one more piece, which is much more haunting in a more provocative, kind of enigmatic way. This is called The Palace at 4 a.m. It was created the following year, uh, also by Giacometti. And it's basically a sort of architectural um, outline where there are these strange little objects that are at play, very much like a, like a dollhouse. And there seems to be a woman standing here. There is a, what appears to be sort of a grooved, almost high lie um, uh, device, like a boomerang that has a groove inside of it with a ball that seems about to be thrown. But then there also seems to be some sort of pterodactyl type of dinosaur up here. And then what appears to be almost like a spine that's just dangling in the middle of this box-like cage shape. It's all very provocative, it's all very strange, it feels very dreamlike, and yet you don't know what it is you're looking at. And it's supplying further evidence that there are more things to think about and connect with than what our daily world allows us access to. And it starts to blossom from that point. So in 1933, Pablo Picasso becomes galvanized by the idea of these uh, surrealist sculptures. And even though he mostly does it in two dimensions, he starts drawing and painting what are essentially surrealist objects. So here you have these, this anatomy of these three women, and you can see how they're combinations of objects we can recognize. For example, the one on the left, there's a chair, there's a pillow, there seems to be two balls set aside, there's maybe a screw in the side, maybe a dowel rod of some sort, and then a little um, you know, fruit bowl at the very top of it. And they're all recombined to suddenly create new ways of seeing um, uh, people and characters and anatomy. Dolly, at the same period of time, writes another article which is about involuntary sculptures. And here the idea is that most people are too pedestrian or philistine to recognize the, I guess, wonders that are around us in our day, everyday life. And so he works with Brassai and he produces six photographs. He basically directs Brassai how to photograph these things. And essentially what you have are objects from, from the real world, debris, waste, small shells, that for Dolly have a sort of extraordinary sculptural life that we don't recognize. And so here you have just a rolled up uh, ticket that Dolly has some photograph at such a close level that it suddenly becomes a sort of extraordinary, almost uh, Art Nouveau type of object. And so again, there's sort of a, a location of the poetic in everyday life that uh, we're blinded to. On the opposite side, there's the retrospective bust of a woman where Dolly does just crazy uh, all, all the time, 24 seven. This is a female mannequin with two corn cobs around her, a sort of a zoetrope um, illustration around her neck. She has ants on the top of her head, large loaf of bread, and then the inkwell from the Angela with the Angelus couple at the top. You know, totally assemblage, totally crazy, not very beautiful, but intriguing. And it's the relation of all these objects in relation to Dolly's own dreams that he shared with us that we know certain things about it. For example, we understand the Angelus couple and their relation and the suggestion of the uh, mantis and those types of things. So all of these things are starting to happen. Mid-1930s uh, exhibitions start happening. And the first one was in 1933 at the, um, the Pierre Cole Gallery. And this was organized by Andre Breton. And here you see a photograph, and there's a number of objects, including two-dimensional as well as three-dimensional objects. There's this curious chair that's to its side, and you can see Dolly's uh, retrospective bust of the woman off here to the far right-hand side. And this leads uh, Breton to write an article about the Surrealist object, where he talks about, in 1935, Surrealism's, the Surreal object is one of Surrealism's most remarkable lines of force. For him, this is the moment the surrealist object is the thing to be embraced as a group. And this leads to a really sensational exhibition for one week, only eight days, at the Charles Rotan Gallery. 
And the Charles Rotan Gallery was a place where there was a lot of African and um, uh, Western Pacific art objects that were being sold. But for this one week, they sort of took over the galleries with surrealism. And what was interesting is that they, they placed all the objects, many of them in glass cases and on particular shelves in a way that suggests almost like an ethnographic museum display. So it wasn't just art objects as sculpture, but rather as something to be studied and revealing uh, truth that maybe we were unaware of. Uh, the installation's provocative. Uh, it shows the surrealist object in relation to mathematical objects and uh, from the Institute Poincare uh, with the glass cabinet and ethnographic and scientific specimens. So it really becomes a strange sort of eruption of the irrational into things that already have a context in the rational world. All these scientific apparatus, mathematical devices, and objects that have been collected from colonial conquests. So here you can see in the main cabinet, right in the very center, there's Duchamp's uh, you know, uh, rack, the bottle rack. We also see on the far right-hand side Dolly's jacket, the aphrodisiac dinner jacket. Over here, this is the object we saw earlier by Picasso, that small still life that was made in three dimensions. And you can see the suspended ball on the bottom left-hand side. So it's sort of like this eruption of all of these different fascinating objects that are mixed in with I believe these are Western Pacific objects, and on the top row, these are those mathematical devices that, uh, that are mentioned. And so it doesn't look like an art show, it looks like an ethnographic uh, study. Here's another photograph of it. The surrealist objects distance themselves from the sculpture, but they have nothing to do with aesthetics, but everything to do with fantasy. So this is sort of that um, cabinet of curiosities exploding into strange and bizarre ways. This is very much a product that looks like it was inspired by a cabinet of curiosities. This is one of the objects by Dolly that was there called Surrealist Object. And what we're looking at here is a cutout box. It contains a paperweight, which is, uh, I believe, this. There's a conical structure down here. Um, there's an erotic figure engaged in, uh, in oral sex. There is a chocolate glove over here. There's a woman's shoe pair of matches in the upper right, and a uh, casting in, um, in a, a plaster of a, a person's foot. So all of these things, obviously, very fetishistic and combined in such a way that it's like this sort of buffet or smorgasbord of perversity. Um, which brings us to a much lovelier object. Uh, so this is pretty hideous, pretty ugly, definitely not something that you know, I think people would want to collect only after the fact do you realize the importance of it, which is why it's now owned by the Rieno uh, uh, Sophia Museum. But this object is quite elegant. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. Marie Oppenheim's uh, teacup is perhaps, along with Dolly's melting watch, the key you know, icon of surrealism of the 1930s. The inspiration for it was pretty remarkable, remarkably simple. Um, she was having lunch with, uh, or having tea with Picasso and Dora Mar, and she was wearing this lovely bracelet that was covered in fur. And Picasso was admiring it and said, you know, you can cover anything with fur anymore. And she immediately, after tea, goes to the local shop, buys the cup and saucer, covers it with this particular fur, this uh, Chinese gazelle pelt, and suddenly just sort of revolutionized the idea of the surrealist object. I would argue this is a beautiful object. This is elegant. This is much more crafted than a lot of the things we've seen. But it has that ability to repulse as well as attract. And when Breton saw it, he thought it was just sensational. And he immediately renames it Luncheon in Fur. <laughs> and says, thus, we suddenly are talking about Manet's uh, Le Déjeuner de l'Herbe. But we're also talking about Venus in Fur by uh, you know, Sacre Massac. So there's all these strange sort of fetish, erotic, erotic um, orientations to it. And the thing that this is supposed to do to allow us to drink tea, because it's covered with animal fur, is suddenly a repugnant idea. Even though it's beautiful, as soon as you add water to it or tea or any kind of liquid, you don't want to put your lips on it. You know? And so there's this strange compulsion to both appeal and repel. There's also Dolly's aphrodisiac dinner jacket one of the more entertaining objects he created. He associates this with his obsession with San Sebastian, Saint Sebastian, who of course was pierced by all the arrows and was a kind of homoerotic uh, figure as a result of that. And here what Dolly has done is he has about 
about 50 shot glasses filled with creme de menthe and a dead fly in each one of them. And in wearing this, it essentially is to gauge the aroused nature of the individual wearing it. So surprising events will happen to the wearer of this through the course of the evening, I guess is the way it's described. And in the original version, which this replaces, you can see there's a woman's brassiere here. In the original version, there was actually an advertisement for a woman's brassiere. So it's in a way a little more discreet, but it suggests um, cross-dressing, you know, more perversions. So there's sort of a, a winking quality to this, which is absent from some of Dolly's other pieces. It's pretty crazy, it's very entertaining, but it's definitely part of the whole surrealist object experience. The Venus de Milo with drawers is incredibly elegant and apparently inspired by basically a really bad pun. Dolly heard the, the word Venus with uh, drawers and he thought chest of drawers. He heard the word chest of drawers and thought of a chest of drawers. And that leads him to take a plaster Venus and cut drawers into it. And then later when it's recast in 1964, it's done in bronze and painted to look like it's plaster. So just like the um, uh, why not sneeze Erosé la vie, weight becomes a part of it when it's uh, created in a second version. But it also allows Dolly to have access to the secrets of her beauty, which are contained from within. So it's, it's a very, it's very fun uh, version of a pun. And then of course the lobster telephone, you know, one of our absolute most essential and most loved objects we have in our collection. There are 10 of them in existence. It was created for Edward James, Dolly's collector. And it has this, it's the perfect example of juxtaposition. Two things that come from completely different worlds that we never associate with each other, but it's a manufactured object that suddenly takes on all of these sort of uh, creepy, funny, erotic overtones with where you put the mouthpiece and what might happen to your ear. You know, there's something sinister about it, and it's very provocative. And so it achieves this great deal, through simplicity, it achieves a great deal of power. And then there's also this beautiful piece by Moreau, and now I'm gonna look at a few objects that were not included in that exhibition but produced in the same year that are pretty sensational. And this one has a stuffed parrot on a wooden perch, uh, stuffed silk stockings with a velvet garter, and a doll paper shoe suspended in a hollow wood frame. There's a derby hat, there's a hanging cork ball, a celluloid fish, and an engraved map. There's a lot of stuff here. And it's provocative, it's interesting. If you were to look at this, you would probably think it's a Joseph Cornell creation. It looks like a Joseph Cornell, but it was done in 1936 independently of that. Um, what it all adds up to, I'm not quite sure, but, uh, but Dolly was not alone in creating these amazing you know, assemblages. This one, you probably know what this is about. Uh, this is again, Marie Oppenheim. Uh, this is called My Governess, which indicates a lot of things about her youth. And essentially it's a pair of high heel pump shoes with the ends that are prepared as if it's a chicken that's being served on a beautiful plate. And it's trussed up. So there's suggestions of bondage, there's suggestions of sexual fetishism, all of these different things come into play in a really simple provocative form. I should also mention that showing this one, the success of her luncheon in fur wound up being a huge, huge detriment to her because suddenly overnight she was a sensation for one object. And for the next 10 years, she would try to work and she would keep destroying everything she produced. None of it felt like it was um, adequate. And so it kind of destroyed her for over a decade until finally in the uh, late 40s, early 50s, she started to find a new voice and became an artist again that was showing in um, international shows. But for 10 years that work actually led to no work being seen by her which is kind of the tragedy of some of these things. Marcel uh, Jean's piece, The Secret of the Gardenia, is pretty intriguing. Um, the strip that you can see around the neck is actually a particular film that he found at a flea market, uh, which was called The Secret of the Gardenia. So that's where the title comes from. There's usually an orange base to it that's in um, velvet, crushed velvet, that uh, makes it even more sensational. But of course, the, the zippers across the eyes suddenly bring about all kinds of ideas of fetishism and bondage and you know, those kinds of unseemly things. But again, this pr it's a provocative encounter with an object that leads to certain altercations that make it even more fantastic. Which leads us to the second really perverse and shocking um, artist to produce objects associated with surrealism, and that's Hans Belmer. 
Um, many of you have probably seen his works before. They are incredibly perverse and all about pedophilia and the sort of unconscious of that. So this is his doll from 1936. And he put together a series of photographs of the doll that he collected and was celebrated by the Surrealists. Breton and, um, and uh, Paul Eloir were just over the world with this thing. They both described his work as the first and only Surrealist object with universal provocative power. Uh, it does have power. I'm not sure that the enthusiasm that they're bringing to it is the same enthusiasm we might encounter it with, but they are amazingly strange, bizarre, horrifying, and um, he kept creating these dolls, adding more and more um, orifices, more and more um, places where uh, appendages can be added and subtracted. And he also, as some of you may be aware, produced some of the most beautiful drawings associated with surrealism. So he was perhaps one of the finest draftsmen associated with the movement, producing some of the most shocking and repugnant images associated with the movement. So this is all you know, through the object, through the surrealist object that he really finds a way into surrealism. So in 1936, um, right at the end of all of this, Andre Breton writes an essay called The Crisis of the Object. Uh, he finds the surreal object represents the desire for objectification finding that one will uh, discover more in the reality concealed within the entity than the immediate data surrounding it uh, to produce a revolution of the object. So it's really remarkable how this theme keeps coming back over and over again. This was 12 years after the beginning of surrealism, and it's still seen as one of the most vital um, objectives of the group. Here he says that objects that form part of, oh, I'm actually gonna skip that one. Basically he's saying, the objects we're producing are in battle with real objects and hopefully will you know, overturn the world of redundancy and, and boredom. So the, the last main area I wanna talk about before the conclusion is environments. Because we've seen a lot of objects and we've seen them standing alone, the idea of desire and dreams and forming the objects. In 1938, the Surrealists had one major exhibition and the way the exhibition was staged was actually in a, a way a celebration of the Surrealist object. Uh, this is the catalog for the exhibition. It happened in 1938 between January and February. Um, it was organized by Breton and Eloard, who were fighting so much that Marcel Duchamp had to be brought in as a negotiator and an intermediary. He was called both the generator and the arbitrator. That's actually his, his title listing in the catalog. Um, and he's the one responsible for inviting Dali to be a part of it, because at this point, Breton had had enough of Dali. Dolly was dead to him. He wanted Dolly to have nothing to do with surrealism, but Duchamp felt that Dolly was essential, and he becomes, in a way, the most essential part of the show. Um, Salvador Dolly and Max Ernst were listed as technical advisors. Man Ray was the lighting technician for the show, and Wolfgang Palin became responsible for the main hall, which has a water and foliage feature. Um, so here's the reason that Dolly perhaps shouldn't have been brought into the, the, the whole thing because for Breton, this was exactly what I think he feared the most, is that Dolly would upstage the show. The rainy taxi was the very first thing you encountered when you arrived. Uh, it was done 1938. It leads to our rainy rolls, which we have in our lobby. Um, and when you go closer to it, you can see that there's a, two mannequins in there. There's basically a driver and the female in the back, uh, back of the room, back seat. There's rain constantly pouring inside of the object, covering them, drenching them, you know, and they are covered with, uh, with plants that are growing in there and also a hundred uh, snails. Dolly said Burgundian snails, which would crawl and leave slimy, oozy, you know, patterns on them. And essentially, if you think about it, this really feels like a car that has that has corpses in it. It has been brought out of a lake, you know, and we are looking at sort of the reanimated bodies of these corpses. It's super creepy and yet super sensational. Everybody wanted to see it, talk about it, um, and it's, as I said, it sort of upstaged the show in some respects. One other thought is that in many ways, these are, this is the way surrealist objects started to expand and allow for an environmental sort of approach where it's even been suggested by a gentleman named Charlie Stuckey, um, who uh, we are, have worked with in the past, a uh, great curator, for him, this is like the first installation. This is the first installation, artist installation, that leads to the very popular 50s and 60s approach to uh, art creation. 
And then you moved into the second area, which was basically the pathway to the show, and they referred to it as the plus belle uh, rue de Paris, or the most beautiful road of Paris, and actually the most beautiful roads of Paris. And what they did is they actually invited um, 16 different surrealists to create mannequins, and above each mannequin was another road. And they were essentially the prostitutes of desire. They were the prostitutes of the imagination. And you can see some of them. This is Salvador Dali's image with uh, all these spoons decorating the body. As you move a little bit further, you have Andre Massal's mannequin, which actually had a birdcage over it. And the mouth was um, closed, but also had this, uh, this little petunia on top of it. And then this really beautiful, elegant one by Maurice Henry, Henry where the, the woman's head is in the clouds. Uh, the breasts are covered by these uh, lovely see-through, I guess, steamers. And then finally, um, just another one, Sonia Moss, the only female that participated. And Sarah was the one who was able to find this for me as we were working on this. Um, she's the only female that participated in the, of the 16. And hers is actually somewhat sinister. There's something about that beetle on top of the face that's much more um, creepy rather than the celebration of eroticism that some of the male artists brought to it. And then finally, you arrive at the main room, and you can see that it, you're greeted by the, um, the palace at 4 a.m. by Jacques Cometti. You walk inside, everything's dark, and there's a brazier. This was what Marcel Duchamp had created. There are 1,200 sacks of coal lining the ceiling, almost like stalactites. And all you see is what looks like a fire in the middle, which leads to that sensation that perhaps things are going to catch on fire. It's actually it's a, it's a light, but it gives you that, uh, that un unnerving sensation. When you would arrive, you would be given a flashlight, and that's how you would see the show. You would kind of wander through the dark with your flashlight to see the artwork. And then at the far end of it, um, when you got through that, you would arrive at Wolfgang Palin's uh, what he called the uh, before uh, la mer, avant la mer, which has, it's this pond with this bed, and there's lilies and water, and all of this kind of this, the intrusion of the irrational into a normal environment. And again, this is provided by the idea of the surrealist object and the dream object that allows them to uh, pursue it this way. This is Andre Breton's contribution, it's the object chest, which is once again a surrealist object. And what's interesting, um, I had never seen these numbers, 3,000 people came to the opening. On Arts Alive, we get 3,000 people here. That's a lot of people. So it was a real sensation. Whether it was um, enjoyed remains another question, but people felt compelled to come and see it. Every day for the, the course of the show, they had 500 visitors, average. So lots of people were coming out to experience surrealism. And then finally, just kind of to wrap things up, just a couple more um, surrealist objects to share that are just too beautiful to not mention, and then a, a summary. <laughs> Victor Bronner, gotta love Victor Bronner, and this, this piece in particular, so simple, so elegant, so perverse. <laughs> I just, enough said, we, we can move on to the next piece. Alexander Calder, of course, was influenced by the surrealist object before um, and during while he was making his mobiles, he also produced some extraordinary objects like this one, which is the wooden bottle with hair. Um, Joseph Cornell. Joseph Cornell was an American. He never went to Paris. He never traveled outside of uh, his mother's house and a few streets nearby. But his entire life was the life of the imagination and the dream. And he would produce objects that were totally about the surrealist experience of nostalgia and the dream. And this is just a, a perfect example of that. Um, and he was the only person other than Man Ray from the United States who Breton acknowledged as a surrealist. So he was a surrealist in every way except for being part of the group in Paris. And then finally, as I mentioned, we had shown Jan Svankmeyer's movies last month one of the most extraordinary object creators and puppeteers. Uh, this is one of his um, images. It's a surrealist sculpture, totally provocative, totally extraordinary, and creepy as hell, you know? <laughs> it's like he, he takes categories of um, cabinetry, of the cabinets of curiosity, and will mix them together to produce very perverse objects. In 2013, the Blaine de, uh, de Dona Gallery had an exhibit. And here we can see some of the objects, which included the bottle rack. It included this Moreau object over to the side. There's uh, Dolly's um, Venus with drawers. There's also the Belmer doll over here to the side. And once again, just kind of summarizing some of these ideas, 
these objects were intended for the viewer to elicit a positive or negative reaction, uh, since they could urge, um, they could arouse urgings and memories that then were conferred upon the object, uh, a reaction of either fascination or repulsion. You know, so they elicit the viewer into the interaction with them. The surrealist object constitutes an intrusion into daily life of a, moder of, a, of a desire that molds and transforms matter according to its requirements. So it's like the object itself needs to exist by the facet of uh, the surrealist dream. And just to review kind of the four key points, first off, surrealist objects, non-aesthetic, not based on beauty, definitely based on the need to be um, created but not to be enjoyed. The second idea, um, they create a sort of social interaction or imply social interaction and exchange by um, basically attacking the status of uh, the bourgeois commodity object. So objects that are part of our, really, our, our daily life that we purchase in stores are sort of in war with the surrealist objects. The surrealist objects are trying to replace them. Third idea is that it's always, in, well, in many ways, an agent of sexual subversion. You know, list, well, moving right back into the fetish object. And the fourth idea is that it's constantly about metamorphosis and the need to change reality, the need to constantly have things and forms transforming. Um, of course, it leads to some unexpected consequences. I think the surrealists thought they were at war with reality and instead they sort of made paved way for the way in media creates a new reality for us. So even though they were meant to shock and disgust and repulse, they have turned out to be beautiful examples of how manufacturers and designers can transform our world into very delightful ways that we can enjoy. This fall, we're gonna be showing uh, Elsa Schiaparelli in relation to Dali. So that idea of surreal fashion coming from the surreal object will certainly be front and center. And then a quick quote um, from William Jeffett, who, as I said, wrote an essay about this, which was a, a great essay. He says, Dolly's understanding of the surrealist object was to dislocate the viewer's false sense of rational certainty and thrust him or her into a disorienting realm of enigmatic doubt. So you think you're, you're good with things, you think the world is as it is, and suddenly the surrealist object comes along and you are torn apart. Your ideas are, are totally you know, severed. Uh, the subversive goal of, you know, to discredit reality captured an essential element of what the Surrealist Revolution was all about. And as the last image to show you, this is a very late photograph from 1956 of André Breton in his studio, which he occupied most of his life, filled to the brim with a cabinet of curiosity, including some of the most extraordinary Surrealist objects, along with tribal art, along with found objects, lots and lots of things he found at flea markets. But it's that idea of transforming your world into the sort of extraordinary cabinet of curiosities. And with that, um, I would like to invite you, when you have the opportunity, to go back to the Chiita exhibition and kind of keep these ideas in mind and see how far and how divergent the worlds are of Salvador Dali and his surrealist colleagues with the world of um, 20th century um, sculptural production which the Chiita show is so beautiful and so elegant and so pure, and this is all so perverse and so <laughs> shocking and so strange that it just seemed like a good opportunity. Hopefully you'll come back next month and join us for William Jeffett talking about Spanish sculpture. Thank you all for coming today.